Okay. okay, welcome back everyone uh, to this uh, to the first talk for today. Uh, it, it's a talk on scattering amplitudes from positive geometries by Pinaki Banerjee from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. Over to you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me start by thanking the organizer uh, for this kind invitation. And it's really uh, great to be back here after a couple of years. And today I'll talk about uh, why physicists like us are interested in uh, this kind of polytopes or this kind of uh, positive geometries. Uh, so, so here is the outline of my talk. Uh, in the beginning, I'll uh, say I have a few slides about uh, regarding physics and the physics motivation. So, uh, if you are really not interested, uh, feel free to. Uh, Oh, so if you are really not interested, feel free to sort of ignore first 10 minutes. <laughs> and then uh, I'll talk about uh, getting high cube scattering amplitudes from uh, positive geometries. I'll define what positive geometries are. And then I'll talk about generalizing these to phi to the power 4 and in general phi to the power p theories. And at the end, uh, I'll conclude with some future uh, directions. So let's start with uh, scattering amplitudes. So first, first thing first, uh, let's ask what are scattering amplitudes? Uh, so it's everywhere. It's like whenever we see something, effectively we are doing some scattering experiments and our eyes are like the uh, detector and lights, uh, we detect the visible light. But if you want to see some, uh, something in more like short length scales, like suppose you want to see atoms, then you do this kind of experiment you learn probably from uh, school. This is called rather for scattering. If you want to see even more like smaller scale, then you go to uh, this kind of big colliders like uh, that we have in a larger and collider in CERN. Uh, so this is very high energy, but high energy doesn't always mean uh, small length scale. It can be huge like in cosmology or like in black hole merging. Everywhere you can actually use this kind of scattering amplitudes technique. So, the whole point of this slide is to show you that scattering amplitudes are sort of ranging from small length scales to huge length scales and the same techniques apply. So it's like sort of one slight physics motivation why you should study. And then next is, uh, since now we know that these are important objects and we know we can observe them and uh, we can do experiments. Next thing is how to compute these things theoretically. When our understanding of nature at the fundamental level based on usually field theory. So we have this kind of Lagrangians. And I chose, I have already chosen this Lagrangian for, uh, for a purpose because I'll get back to it later when I talk about getting phi cube amplitudes from positive geometries. So we have these phi's at the fields. These are some scalar fields and these are not observable. These are auxiliary, uh, these are fields, but these are not observable which we observe are scattering amplitudes. Now, to go from here to the scattering amplitudes, we go through some, uh, some techniques called Feynman diagrams. And these Feynman diagrams come up when, so our understanding of quantum field theory is mostly perturbative in nature. What we usually do is that we take lambda very small and we expand around these uh, known results. So it might look, it's very naive because is like sort of very restrictive range. But whatever, doing that, we get this kind of diagrams. They are just uh, some, some terms, some expressions. And in this case, these are just three diagrams that we are interested in. And I've made this in red because you can see that this is not a planar diagram. You cannot draw it on a plane. We call this S channel, this is T channel, and this U channel. And so this is the amplitude for so leading order amplitude for this, uh, this theory. And uh, you see that we, this one by S and one by T, this part is planar and this is non-planar. So when you go to the phi cube theory, uh, getting amplitude from positive geometry, we'll get this part, one by S over one by T, because we are interested in planar uh, diagrams or other way of saying that we're interested in fixed ordering. We are not flipping the particles. We're just fixed order and on a plane. Okay, so that means that 
you have this uh, particle coming in, they do something, we don't know what they do, that's the whole point. And then at infinity, in principle, we measure them. Like there's a detector, sorry. Something is happening, timer. I think I put on the timer. Anyway, so uh, yeah. So I, I, I'll get back to it uh, in, in, in another picture, then it'll be probably more clear. See so, yeah. Uh Sorry, I didn't get it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so known particle, we know how to characterize them by spin and mass and all these things. But the thing is that uh, it's about computing things. Like computing things are harder. Suppose I know I give you the, the, this, sorry, this Lagrangian. This Lagrangian I give you. Uh, in principle, it's all known, right? How to do it. The best thing would be to solve it exactly, but we cannot do that. So we do it small part of the expansion around this uh, lambda equal to small lambda. But... It, yeah, but but in this theory, suppose this is this is your world. Suppose there is only one particle, one type of particle in the world. Still, you cannot solve it. That's the point, right? I mean, you, you don't know how to solve this. No, this is nonlinear uh, interaction, so you cannot solve exactly. Or even you go higher order in lambda, it will be more complicated. It's exponentially like this term will generate will be like exponentially larger. So I'll get back to it. Yeah, but I, but I think it won't be that important in the end because it's just motivation. So I, maybe I just uh, go to the uh, next slide saying that it looks like it's very naive because I'm just treating a lambda very small, but you may think that like it's very naive and like how good is it? The thing is that this, uh, the most, most accurate prediction of in science in this quantum electrodynamics, if you compute this uh, magnetic moment of electron and you, this is a theoretical prediction and this is the experimental result up to six loop or five loop. I, I, I don't remember that now, but it's like one, it's accurate in one part in 10 to the 11 or, uh, so this is the most accurate kind of thing. So doing this naive thing, you get this kind of uh, crazy accuracy. Now, after saying that, the, the obvious question is, why should we look for new methods then? Because it's so accurate, right? Now, there are issues. That's what I was going to uh, get back to, is that in 1980, so I, I'll give you one example historically and tell you why uh, Feynman diagrams are not probably the natural language for amplitudes. In 1984, this review came up and they said that it's almost impossible to compute two to four scattering amplitude in foreseeable future. Within a few months, these guys computed uh, the amplitude for two to four. And this result was eight page long, not the, not the, not the derivation, the expression was eight, eight page long. But they say that they somehow they saw something and they thought it should be more beautiful than that. And after a few months, they came up with this formula, which is not two to four, but it's in a single line. And you can see that it's for two to n minus two. So like n particle amplitude. So clearly we are missing something. I mean, they were missing, I mean, it's known from the eighties then that Feynman diagrams are not the full story. So what have we learned so far? So this is what I was <clears throat> saying in the beginning. So what we know is that there is this particle which are far away. These are the in states. They come up, they do something, and then go at infinity. We measure them. And then what's happening in between, we don't know. So one standard way is to replace them by Feynman diagram that we did earlier, and it's quite successful. But it's not the full story. And if you are interested in, say, higher number of particles interacting or other kind of uh, mathematical structures, probably this is not a good language. So in this talk, so there are many other point of views. There are ma many methods. They call these on-shell methods, where you don't introduce particles. Sorry, you don't introduce auxiliary variables like fields. You talk about uh, real particles. This is one of them. This is called. Uh, getting amplitudes from positive, positive geometries. And uh, basic examples of po positive geometries are polytopes. Those are the sort of most uh, natural. One quick question to 
Sure. By, by that, what do you mean to measure uh, various? Yeah, you can measure the spin or the mass right. energy of the particle. Okay. That, yeah. So those are the sort of the quantum numbers that you can. In this case, I I will deal with only momenta. So p's are the momenta. So there is no other spin or anything with a scalar particle because it's the simplest uh, simplest object. So now I'll go to the talk. So if you have already ignored the first part, from here the talk begins. So let's uh, so first let's define what are these positive geometries. So if you're interested in mathematical uh, so rigorous mathematics of these positive geometries definition and all this stuff, I refer to this paper by uh, Arkani Hamid Bai and Lam. For me, this will suffice for this talk. So a positive geometry is a closed geometry with boundaries of all co-dimensions. This all is important. So these are the examples of positive geometries you can see. And this is not an example because you don't have co-dimension co two uh, boundary. There is no sort of kink points. And it, yeah, in this case, I will be focusing on mostly that's the just yeah. So yeah, so polytopes are the one one kind of examples, which are like sort of in a sense uh, not so interesting examples. But in this talk, we'll be only dealing with polytopes. But it. So the framework is valid even for non polytopal things, which are not polytope but positive geometry. There are some objects like that. I think, uh, like the ampitohedron or Grassmannian, I think also. <laughs> yeah. Uh, prob probably. The, the triangle a bit right like party triangle oh, okay. and, and that, that's, yeah yeah I, I think that will be because there will be carby uh, yeah carby linear kind of yeah, that will be the example in this talk what will be happening everything is convex like all these are sort of normal kind of stuff but i think those can be generalized too i mean this this is like sort of bigger it has more uh, more than polytopal uh, objects like but yeah so this is the definition of this for uh, uh, for this talk say sorry yeah i i i think this for the yeah let's forget about this part and say that these are just polytopes then probably it's fine. This is the convex polytopes. No, in this case, just, just compact polytopes. So, and the, given a positive geometry, so there is a unique differential form, which is known as a canonical form. So this, this differential form is fixed by these two properties. So for any uh, poly, uh, say polytope, there is a logarithmic singularities at boundary and only at the boundaries. And this, Singularities are recursive. So if you restrict to the boundary, so boundary is also a positive geometry because it's a sort of recursive structure. So if you restrict to the boundary, the canonical form, you get another canonical form for the boundary uh, geometry. Yeah, so it's unique up to overall sign. So if you just keep doing this, at the end of the day, you will like sort of go to the vertices and then you can have choices plus or minus one. There's nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So these two together makes it unique because you you have you, I mean I will give give one example for like lower dimension it will be clear. Okay. Now. Now here we'll be interested in this kind of uh, objects which are like tree level planar amplitude for massless scalar theories. And it can be easily generalized to massive theory. Alok will talk about that also. Uh, but for the oh, the previous slide, yeah, yeah, you just compute the the residue. No, it's just I think I, when I give give you one example, it will be more clear. Yeah. So uh, and the philosophy is that given a theory. You can identify this polytope, 
in the, in the kinematic space, I'll define the kinematic space. Uh, it's just the space of momenta. I, I told you that only data we have here is the momenta, momenta at infinity. And then we, that's not enough. We just, we associate, uh, I mean, for any positive geometry or polytope, we have this canonical form that I just defined. And you just pull back that to the, uh, to the geometry to get scattering amplitude. So I'll give you examples of that. And uh, like sort of physics output is this, that locality and unitarity of uh, your amplitudes are output instead of input of your, like in Lagrangian, you just put locality in, uh, in, inside, but here it just comes out of uh, the geometry itself. Okay. Now I'll define what this kinematic space is. So, this kinematic space of n massless, we are dealing with massless momenta, massless particles, massless momenta pi spanned by this, uh, this variables because pi square is zero. We have only cross term like pi dot pj. And so there are like n choose two number of these terms, but they satisfy the momentum uh, conservation. So there are n such conservation uh, equations. So the dimensionality is this n choose two minus n, this n into n minus three by two, I just count it. And this is another uh, way of sort of collecting the momenta variable SSI with some uh, label like one to n, and it will be like just, just some algebra. But this part is important. Since we are dealing with planar uh, kinematic, planar dynamics or planar kinematic variables, what we have is that this xij variables are sort of natural variable. Sorry. Or it's just like you just collect, say there are four five particles. You just say that one, two, and three, you just uh, collect it. So it's like PI, PI plus PJ plus, sorry, P1 plus P2 plus P3 whole square, right? And then PI, P1 square, P2 square, P3 square as zero. So you have just these uh, cross terms, one, two, two, three. And, and uh, this is just another way of writing the same thing. And now, sorry. Let's solve this thing Oh, no, oh, this capital I is just some uh, index. Yeah, just some this, this, uh, it can be any, like it, it doesn't have to be order or anything. So here XIJ is defined like, that's why I defined it earlier, but it's easier to define directly in terms of PI. Now you can see that, right? It's like you define I to, so PI plus PI plus one to PJ minus one, and then you just square it. And so it's natural in like sort of in this kind of diagrams. You can see that xij means just is chords. If you just think about it, like you are sort of adding these two, three, four, five up to six, not seven, up to six. It's like sort of adding this up. I mean, it's natural for planar kinematics. And you can see that i and i plus one, i i plus one is zero, just from like massless particles, and one one n is also zero. I mean, only the diagonals are the non uh, like sort of non-trivial objects. Yeah, so this momentum conservation is there. So XIJs are related to uh, this, this Mendelssohn variable. So you can just do this algebra and you just get this linear relationship. Sorry. So the Mendelssohn variables, basically, they are basis elements of a polynomial. Uh, no, no. Base, right? no, no. Mendelssohn variables are just uh, some. Here I defined it. So these are the Mendelstam variables. These are the name of the, uh, some particular combination of PI plus PJ. So it's a low range invariant. It should be zero. Sorry? It should be zero. Some... No, it is PI dot PJ is not zero. PI square and PJ square are zero because those are massless particles, but there can be PI dot PJ. Those are the only low range invariant object. So these are the only, it's just sort of, I'm sort of spanning the space in terms of this basis. So we are going to a nicer basis which is this XIJ, these variables are sort of nicer in this, uh, in this kinematic space, because this is planar. If you have non-planar things, then you cannot do this. Uh, anyway, so this SIJ can be expanded in terms of this X, XS. I'm just, this is some algebra. But from physics perspective, this... Uh, yeah, those are the only three that you can have for in this case, like you can exchange, but there, they can be related by some, uh, symmetry is like, yeah, yeah, for, for, for bosons, yeah. 
No, but it's not, I think even it's not working. Space, space bar. Uh, AV team, we're not able to move the slides forward. Can you help us out? So, so what are the constraints on your geometries? Maybe you'll explain now. So your, your geometries, um, you need to pick them carefully, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just combinatorics. I mean, huh. there is a combinatorial geometry that has some property, but that doesn't give you the uh, amplitude. It, it's like a particular, uh, like that geometry in Kin in kinematic space, it has to be like very particularly embedded inside. Right. And the and the, the nice thing is that you don't need physics input for that. I mean, there are mathematical construction of this embedding, like there are this uh, realization of these polytopes inside kinematic space. Uh -huh. People studied it, and somehow those are the important ones. Those are the only one that gives you uh, that give you the so, uh, amplitude. So that's a nice thing. I mean, it's not like yeah. There is without physics input, you can just get the amplitude in that uh, in that sense. Uh -huh. So, which amplitudes are are, are, uh, are nice in this sense? That's something we'll talk about. Ah, oh, sorry. Which which geometries are nice in this sense? Along yeah, 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 yeah. So, is there, has there been so it has. Time? Yeah, it's not classified, but we we know. Like, I I'll, I'll tell you uh, why why some of these uh, geometries are actually giving you correct results yeah. because. There are some particular properties of fact, like factorizations or of amplitude or something like that. Those, which are actually given by the properties of the boundary of the polytope. So, you will see that those polytopes will appear whose boundaries are like product of lower dimensional uh, polytopes. So th that's the sort of information of the amplitude. Uh, no, these are like just some simple polytope. One one polytope is very famous. is the Stasher polytope, this uh, associated hadron. This, this will make appearance for this phi cube theory. And the others are uh, the, for phi, phi to the power p theories, they'll be called accordia hadron, which is generalization of uh, associated hadron. But those are not as simple as, uh, like given a particular number n, you have a unique, like given a dimension, you have one, uh, associate hadron, but you will see that for the other polytopes, you'll have like more complicated structure. There can be different kind of. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. So I was here, I think. Yes. So I said that this just for some, I mean, you don't need to understand this, but if you know, uh, like field theory, this is just a propagator. Okay, so now uh, let's go to the phi cube amplitudes and how to uh, get the positive geometry. And this, this is what I was explaining. The claim is that this associated hadron will give you the uh, amplitude. And I think most of you, I mean, this is, I don't need to explain this, what uh, associated hadron is, but uh, let me just tell you that the, if I start with this example of pentagon and I just triangulate it, the complete triangulations are given by the vertices of this polytope. This is the uh, uh, associated hadron or the Stasher polytope discovered by Stasher. And then this, if we just remove one chord, one by one, this chord, then you'll get uh, lower and lower co-dimension uh, or, or sorry, you go in higher dimensional boundaries or, so in the bulk, there is nothing. So it's like you remove another chord, then there is inside this bulk. So in this case, it happens, that this pentagon is given by some pentagonal uh, polytope, but it's not always the case, of course. For example, for the 1D polytope, you have these two triangulation, complete triangulations. So you have this, and then you flip it to the other side, then you have this. And zero dimensional associated for any polytope is, should be a point because there is nothing to triangulate. This is triangle itself. Now, the question is that everything was combinatorial. So why should it be? Uh, why should it know about phi, uh, phi cube amplitude? I think uh, someone asked this question. Now I'll give you two motivations or sort of heuristic argument why it should know, but you don't need to know this. I just want to like sort of uh, convince you that it somehow knows about this thing because I talked about these two diagrams, Feynman diagrams, S and T channels. You see that these dual polygons are exactly, these uh, triangulated dual polygons are exactly these two channels. So somehow this has the information about these two uh, vertices. This, so these two vertices 
for this case, these two vertices of this polytope have this information about uh, the two channels. And for n particle, it can be generalized to n minus three dimensional thing. So the whole thing is that if you draw these trivalent graphs for n particles, there'll be n minus three internal lines. And those actually correspond to this, uh, these chords. So that's the connection. And another connection is what I was explaining is this. So this is called the factorization. I put it in quote because this is also coming from field theory understanding. Uh, all boundaries of this n-dimensional, uh, or I should say n minus three. When I say n, I mean n particle or n uh, n gone. So n minus three is the dimension of the polytope. And if you, you have a n times a n a n one times a n two uh, kind of objects where n one and n two are less than n. So example is better. Suppose A6 is three-dimensional polytope, this. So this is the polytope. I took this from Wikipedia. Now A4 is one-dimensional polytope, and A4 times A4 is this square. And A5 is the pentagon, and A3 is the point. So we have this. And you can see that in this polytope, we have only this kind of faces, no hexagon, for example. So that's the beauty of this thing, that it has the information about the factorization of uh, amplitude. And it, it works for any n, arbitrary n. No, no, this product. It's just product. Okay. Now, so I said that this only combinatorics won't work because you, you need to have the amplitude information for the this logarithmic diverge, logarithmic poles. And why logarithmic? If you know again from field theory side, we know, or from particle physics, we know that it has to have, we are dealing with three amplitudes, so it has to have some poles. There is no branch card or anything else. And so the natural thing is to write down like dx by x kind of differential form, and which is exactly these things. And we get uh, this n minus three dimensional uh, differential form. And we sum over all. So this planar G means that summing over all graphs. So there's n minus three vertices. We're summing over all those vertices, basically. So it has all the information that you can see uh, of the boundaries of the polydome. So. Uh, basically, maybe I, I'll give this example and it'll be clear. So, di so if we demand projectivity, say that this is like very boring symmetry. Suppose you say this x i j, you multiply by some fixed function of x. I mean, like identical function of x. It remains same, and there are some physics motivation for that also. But if we just suppose demand that, then we can fix this uniquely up to overall sign, and overall sign is not important. Okay, so now let's get back to this example, then it'll be clear. So. In the uh, this this example, we have these two channels. It's two four and one three, x two four and x one three, or these are also called A and P. You see that. So you have these two poles logarithm. So you have d log s by t. So it's basically like ds by s minus dt by t. That minus sign is this uh, this minus sign. So basically, what I'm saying is that if you have this, suppose you start with this triangulation. You write down the differential form. If you get this by flipping once, then you get a minus sign. But if you have more vertices, if you like even number of flips, then you get flip is like you just remove this one and put this on the other. It's like generating the triangulations. Yeah. It's also called mutation. Yeah. Similarly, you can do it for this pentagonal. It'll be more complicated, but you can just get this. And uh, the whole this form is projective and it has all the information about the amplitude. Now, in the beginning, I said how to get the amplitude. So we, now we know all the ingredients. We have this canonical form. This is what I explained, ds by s and dt by t. And this is minus sign here. And then we have to embed this polytope in kinematic space. So that's what, where this, uh, this point comes in when arbitrary. So this is the polytope now, this, this line segment. And see this embedded in particular way. It's not like it's just 45 degree angle. It's not arbitrary uh, these things. You can do it, fix it by some physics input, but the great thing about this is that you don't need that physics input. You can just, just from math, like from maths, you can just fix this uh, embedding. And you see that how, how it, it works. Now you pull back this canonical form on this geometry. That just means that you restrict your, this, this form is everywhere. Now we just restrict to this line segment. And it has nice uh, singularities, logarithmic singularities here and here. And if you just restrict it, you get, get this amplitude, this, as I advertised earlier, 
1 by s and 1 by t. But there is no Eve channel, of course. There is this planar limit. And the, thing, the beauty of this approach is that it works for arbitrary n. So for any n, you can generalize this. And you can just get the planar amplitude. What is the embedding again? Sorry? What is the embedding? Yeah. So this is just saying that uh, so one way of say, saying these things that these geometries are already there. You sort of, sort of need to uncover them in a particular fashion. So, so these are naturally sitting there. I mean, I think uh, in Alok's talk, he'll explain this in more detail with other, like there's some quiver, uh, quiver sort of way of getting uh, this constraint, which I am not describing, but there are ways of getting this embedding from directly from maths input. There's no, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's, that's hyperplane. Sorry? Hyperplane. Yeah. What does that have to do with the embedding? So, firstly, uh, when we say polytopes, usually we already mean they're embedded in Euclidean space. So you're re-embedding it. Yeah, it? yeah, exactly. So that will be very, yeah, that, that will be very important in the next talk, in Alok's talk. Uh, so you can actually do something before embedding that into the, so this is kinematic space. This is not Euclidean space. Right, so you're re-embedding it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So you're embedding it into kinematic space, which is not Euclidean. I mean, it's a linear space. It's not. It's not the standard Euclidean space. Yeah, but it's it's the the space I described. is k n, n minus uh -huh. n into n minus three by two dimensional. So you can see that for four is two D. So for four n into n minus three by two, that's the, that's the four uh, the the two D, the S and T, and then this is n minus three dimension, which is one. It's, it's a line. Yeah, it's a line for this case for four particles. What, what is that polytope? Uh, this is line segment that we described, right? Oh, yeah, for, for four particles. So maybe I, I should write it or somewhere. Maybe I have it here. So, so dimension of the polytope is n minus three. Dimension is exactly same as the number of this uh, uh, chord. So that's n minus three. If you go for say five point, then we two such chords. So then polytope will be two dimensional. So if you go high in dimension, so it's in general n minus three dimension, the polytope. An embedding space is n into n minus three by two dimensional. So it's, you can always embed it because it's always bigger than, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So what you're trying to do is that you want to embed this polytope in another space, which is of lower dimension. So it becomes like comparatively easier to view that polytope, something like that. No, so no, this is not because yes. this is of, this is because it's easier because because somehow you have to have the information about the, you have to have the data of momenta. You have to go like, our data is like particles coming from infinity and going to infinity. We don't have any other data than momenta. So you, somehow you have to have the inf information about the momenta. And this is the space of, in a sense, the space of momenta. So S, S and T are just like some combination of like P1 plus P2 whole square or it P1 plus P3 whole square. So these are just like space of momenta. Is, uh, so you need to have those information, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't be uh, giving you uh, any like physical object. It's mathematically fine, but to get some uh, physics out of it, you need to have some this dependence of the Mendelssohn variable somehow. That's uh, yeah. But this is, so it's physics motivated. It's not nothing to do it like just pure maths. But were you saying that there is some, uh, when you said there's a mathematical way to do it, is, is it that the geometry of the polytope intrinsically determines uh, a map, this embedding map. Uh, there's yeah, a way yeah. to so just purely start with the polytope and. Uh, so what I'm saying that there are natural embedding, which like mathematician uh, studied without thinking about physics. Yeah. The natural way, what you get, those are exactly the, those embedding that that are useful for amplitude. So those are the one that gives you the amplitude. So they were studied example, independently get, for different reasons by mathematicians, and you're saying that the same yeah, things appear yeah, in the exactly. So it's it's quite amazing that it works because I mean when this was first discovered by these Arkan Hamidan collaborators, they of course ran into it by I think physics argument, but later I think Hugh Thomas and collaborators they actually uh, for the associate Hadron case they studied it and they actually showed that it's like like naturally embedded and they, they call this A B H Y. Uh, I mean, it's given by this paper, ABHY. It's called ABHY. Uh, this, I, I can give you later, and there are a few references, uh, probably it's there on my slides as well. The canonical form, or this oh. embedding comes from the canonical form, or no? No, no. It's embedding is uh, like 
canonical form is a different thing. Canonical form you can have in the kinematic space, right? If you have the kinematic space, you can just write down the canonical form. Oh, it's oh, the then you yeah, the, the second step is like you embed the this thing, then you restrict the canonical form to get the amplitude. These are sort of two different. Okay, now uh, I think I should go to the five p five power p theory. Uh, so the natural generalization would be to uh, study dissections. Like instead of tying triangulate things, we can do is like break it in terms of quadrilaterals, or you can have. In this case, again, I have drawn triangulations, but here you can see that there are triangles and quadrilateral mixed. But in this talk, I will be mostly focusing on this pure thing, where uh, all, and mostly talking about the quadrilateral dissections. But you can have other, other things as well. Now, the math result is that you can always get uh, some simple polytopes, which are we are interested in, by doing this uh, this kind of dissections. And by simple polytope, I mean that in d-dimensional polytope, for each vertex, we have like adjacent faces are number of adjacent faces are d. And the boundary structure again, I already uh, I think talked about this. So it is true again for this, and I I call this A C because these are called accordiahedron instead of like earlier we call this associahedron and these are now accordiahedron and associahedron is a special case of this accordiahedron which is sort of nicer because it's a single object and this will be clear later when i uh, give you one some examples that the shape of the so now we have different you can have different kind of polytopes given dimension earlier you have like only one single uh, polytope per given dimension so those are generated by some particular dissections now these dissections, if they are related by some say rotation or something, uh, then they will not change the shape. They will generate the same shape, but uh, yeah, some reordering kind of thing. It will be clear when I give you an example. So the question is, is there a simple polytope directly if you just dissect with this quadrilateral? The answer is no. You need to be more careful with this. So you will run into problem even at the like lowest order, which is six. Like if n is equal to six, you see that there are three such quadrilateral complete quadrangulations, but it has to be one dimensional polytope. So you need one dimensional polytope, but you need simple polytope, one dimensional simple polytope with three vertices, which is not possible. So somehow you need to get around this by choosing two of them out of four, out of three. So I have to like sort of do this. And this is the compatibility rule. And there are different kinds of compatibility rules. Some of them are confusing, but those are all equivalent. And Using this compatibility rule, we can define uh, polytopes for phi to the fourth theories, which are like doing these quadrilateral things. These are called Stokes polytope. And this is first discovered sort of by Baryshnikov and then this uh, Shapoton also worked on this, these things. Uh, sorry. Can you explain how you construct this polytope, say, for phi four, uh, phi 4? Yeah, so uh, I, I'll come back to it. So I, I'm just showing you the problem here. So I'm, so I'm telling you that like, if you just blindly follow the rule of this associated thing, it doesn't work because there are more vertices than, uh, uh, than the, the dimension or yeah, than needed. And, oh, sorry, channels, this physics language, channels just vertices. So it just means the vertices of the polytope, like complete quadrangulations. You can see that there are only three possible complete quadrangulations. Those are three vertices. So it would be great if we can do it like uh, associahedron, then it would be a single simple polytope, but that's not the case. And for phi to the power p, it just holds true. Like you can just go through uh, same steps with p and they call this accordiahedron family. Uh, and Stokes polytope is one example of them for p equal to four. And for p equal to three is associahedron. Yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll give you examples later. I'm just uh, defining now. Now the, here comes the compatibility rule. So it's it's easier to explain uh, like from this picture than explaining in words. Suppose you start with this hexagon and you just choose this dissection one four. Now you want to see which are the one. There are two more dissections. One is two five and three six, and you want to see which one is compatible because you just need to choose two, right? So you can the the rule is that you draw another hollow uh, hexagon like this. I'm not drawing the other lines because it will make these things more messy. And the point is that these are called cuts. So what do you, the rule is that suppose you draw this one four again, one prime, four prime, then you just draw this part and this, this dissection is called D one four. So if this is connected, 
then you call that that's compatible. This is also like connected because you draw this one six and three four and this one four line, then this is also connected. So what is not connected? So this will be more clear. Suppose I do the other other way around this two, two prime five prime, we see that this is not connected. Sorry. We have no understanding how you go from the left to the right, even in the previous one. Oh, oh yeah. So this is just a rule. So given this one, one to six, I, I just define something which is like one prime to six prime, just slightly rotated like in between one to two and all these things. Then I'm just saying that this one prime four prime has to be compatible with one four because that's the one four. I mean, it will always, my, I mean, I'm just sort of building a rule uh, to define. Yeah. What is, what are you doing? Yeah. So maybe I should slow down. So you have this hexagon to start with one to six. Then I am just doing this, like I, I'm choosing one dissection, which is one four. Now there are two more dissections, like two more. I can do, I could have done this two, five and three, six. Yeah, those two are not what you have done. No. So I'm just saying that like, these are just bookkeeping stuff, these primes. I mean, this just decides for me, which are compatible. So this says that one, four is compatible with three, six. There should be primes here, but I'm just removing those primes. So, so what? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Can you please explain how you go from the left to the right? Yeah. So here. So you have one four, I understand. Yeah. And you drew some kind of dual hexagon with yes. the primes. Yeah. Right. But then what do you do? I'm not. Then suppose I draw this one prime, four prime line. Okay. okay. Then uh, the rule that I'm assigning is that when I draw this, then I take this arm of this polygon. And this one, and then I, I always keep this one four intact. Okay. If they are connected, this this what is connected? The whole thing is two one two one four five. The whole thing is connected, right? Then I call this con uh, this one four. I keep this. I mean, the whole point is I keep it. If they are connected, I throw it away. If they are not connected, like two five five draw, that's not connected, right? This is the, the, the dissection arc, the right one. Huh. And I think we fix the endpoints of we fix a dissection of the dual hexagon, yes. which is the one prime four prime, and then he keeps the arcs which lie you know on which the boundaries of the new dissection. Yeah, so, but he did, but he is but if you look at the second one, he is keeping three six. Yeah, instead of one, so one four and one prime four prime. I mean, it, I mean, there has to be. I mean. I mean, one, four, I mean, I should have written this as one prime, four prime, and three prime, six prime, but this is just bookkeeping device. I'm saying that like, by definition, suppose you have a bigger polygon, maybe I'll do one more example in uh, for eight point, maybe I can do it on board, that will be easier. So it's clear, I think this part should be clear that if it's not connected to this, whatever, I can just forget about this, like this two prime, five prime, this is like not connected uh, in this picture. So I think one four though. One four, exactly. If I took two five, then two of five course. prime will be clear. exactly. So, so, two, two, so I think the next next point will be clear. I think next slide it will be clear more if I go there. So it's with respect to a fixed you fix exactly. Uh, so so given so that, that's why I said that given D14, given dissection, these are compatible, right? So given kind of adjacent to it, but two five is not adjacent to it, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here in this in this sense, this is just connectedness. So it's of course yeah, one way of saying that this is adjacent. But for bigger, it will be complicated if you have like different kind of like. Here I'm dealing with a smaller uh, like hexagon and four uh, quadrilateral. But I could have like one triangle, one quadrilateral, and all. So this will be more complicated. So this rule is sort of generic rule that works. Uh, that's why I'm just defining it. Yeah, it will be clear I think uh, in the next uh, next example. So. So that's what I said. So you start with one four, this dissection, three six is compatible. So you have this polytope. If you start with two five, one four is compatible. So you have another polytope. And same is true, like you start with three six, it will be two five will be compatible. So it's now, you see that this is now complicated than associate hedron. So given, so there are three distinct one day accordia hedra, or these are called Stokes polytope. But in associate hedron case, we had only one. 
Now, maybe uh, I have some time, so I, I can just do this. It'll be clear. Uh, should I draw it here? So maybe I just draw this here, it'll be more clear. In real time, it's easier to follow. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I just take, these are the, Follow thing and these are like one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime. Now suppose I do the right side, which is easier probably. Oh, uh, I start with one, one, four, five, eight. So in red, I say one, four, and five, eight. And now of course one, four, so one prime, one prime, four prime, and this will be adjacent as I said, and five, eight will be also there. But now question is what else are uh, compatible, right? So you can start. So we can forget about two and uh, two and six because they are not compatible. Of course, they are always be uh, disjoint. But uh, say three, if I have three prime, then I can go here, but that will be just triangulation, not quadrangulation, right? Three five is just like triangulation. So I have to go. Uh, I can go to uh, three. Uh, seven won't, won't work, right? Maybe three, six. And six is not compatible, right? So three, eight will be compatible, yes. Oh, sorry, not this eight, this eight, yeah. Right? Yeah, this is a quad, uh, quadrangulation. And uh, what else? Suppose I start with four, seven won't work. Uh, seven is not connected to anything, right? Or sorry, seven will work. Yeah, I think it's yeah. Yeah, because seven is connected. I, I forgot this line. This is, yeah. So I think these are the only only ones. So so only things that will appear are this this. I think I listed it here. If I did it correctly, three. Yeah. So if I start with this dissection. Uh, uh, one four five eight then i'll only allow to use this uh, these are the compatible ones but if i start with this triangulations one six one one four one six then there are these triangulations these many are allowed now it will be clear in this picture so this is just the one dimensional zero dimensional polytope this is one dimensional polytope there are three of them i've just drawn one one four three six there are two more but suppose you start with this and you can just now generate this with this flip that I described. So you can just, you, you see that there are one, four, five, eight, four, seven, three, eight, and that's, that's it. So these are the four that appear in this, in this uh, uh, polytope. But in this polytope, if you start with this dissection, one, four, one, six, you can see that there are like uh, this five, eight, three, eight, and uh, three, six. And yeah, so there are five such possibilities and they all appear. Here, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, there are common such thing, yeah. No, but, but yeah, so the thing is that it will depend on the path. I mean, it, it's not, uh, it, it's not like, uh, stand, I mean, they share, they can share uh, vertices, but still they can generate, uh, it depends on the, like, how you start, like, it depends on the reference quadrangulations. Like, one best example is probably this, right? So here, you start with one four, you get three six. But if you start with two five, you get one four. So that's the thing, they're sharing this one four, but depends on your reference uh, quadrangulations. No, so we, we, we couldn't do it, right? Yeah. So that, that would be a great thing to get a bigger polytope where everything's set, like sort of filled in, but that doesn't work that way. Yeah, but it's complicated than that. It, it somehow, it doesn't work that way, yeah. So these are like n is equal to eight case. And for, so you can see that for n is equal to eight, there are two different kinds of polytopes. And this is what I was sort of explaining. If you start with this kind of uh, reference, then you generate uh, pentagonal surface. But you start with this parallel kind of dissection, you generate this 
uh, this kind of surface. And if you start with any rotated things, like if you just start with say one, uh, six, two, five, then you always in the same shape. So that's the sort of observation that, uh, for, and this is true for any aquadihedron. Uh, these are the Stokes polytope because we chose quadrilateral to. Uh, sort of. I have a question. Yeah. So uh, why are you only dissecting in two quadrilaterals? And uh, yeah, I could have done it in different ways. So just for simplicity, suppose I am. So physics point of view, I'm just interested in phi four theory. Suppose then okay. I have to do this. If I'm interested in say phi four plus phi cube, then I'll do something like uh, one. So I can just. Uh, do like, I don't know whether, so I could have done, uh, sorry, yeah, even for this, I could have done this, right? So one side I triangulate, other side I coordinate. So these are like mixed, mixed kind of, uh, this also, also generate polytopes. They're like mixed, uh, but simplicity, I just chose only uh, high power P. And uh, why are you interpreting, I mean, the number of, this compatible uh, dissections as uh, polytopes. Uh, I mean, what do you do after that? Uh, interpret it, it as polytopes. So I'm just interpreting like when you complete triangulate, those are vertices, and the shared uh, they share some something right here. They share they say one four. Uh, this thing they shared. So if I just remove this five eight, then this line is denoted by this one four. All these lines are connected by one uh, sort of shared. A diagonal that is the sort of link between uh, this kind of yeah they're related by one flip in a sense like here to here there's one flip you just remove it and then put it the compatible so all these compatible dissections are uh, generating the polytope okay so now we have sorry you have a question so now you have this uh, uh, this polytope then again we, we need to do, play the same game which is that we need to write down this planar scattering form, which will have the information about the amplitude. And here also, this sigma is doing the same thing that I just explained, You're just flipping one uh, diagonal. So for example, the simplest possible thing is the one dimensional thing. You start with this one four and three six is compatible. And you have this D log form, which is just as, as easy as associated done, but now there are three of them. So you have to sort of sum over them to get the full amplitude. Now here, this is, the, this is something I was uh, explaining. I, I, I didn't uh, explain, I won't explain it here also. So there are infinitely many ways that you can embed this polytope inside the kinematic space. And uh, this remarkably happens that these are the one that, uh, this, this is some references that they studied uh, and also we reviewed in one of our papers. So you get like, so it doesn't matter, the combinatorially they are polytopes like this pentagonal polytope, but this, shape is important, like this 45 degree angle is important to get the amplitude. And these are the ones that you get even from uh, directly from mathematics. Also this 45 degree angle is important. And uh, this, this is for associated and this is for also two dimensional associated and this also holds true for accordia hydron that I just described, but I'm not going to describe that here. Now, how to get the amplitude? I said that you, you cannot, suppose you get, uh, so suppose you take one of the polytopes in 1D, then you will miss one channel. Physic in physics wise, you will miss one channel or mathematically you miss one vertex. So you have to somehow add them up with some particular weightage to get the amplitude back. So this is one example of this simplest example for this n is equal to six case for five four. There are three such, uh, these are the exactly these three, sorry, these three. So there are three polytopes and there are three uh, differential forms. So you have to restrict them and then sum them up to get the amplitude. That's what I showed here, which is uh, here. So there are like X, one, four, three, six, two, five, one, four, and three, six, two, five. And these are the constant. In this case, it turns out to be half. You can fix this, but there is no intrinsic way of fixing these things directly from the polytopes. You have some of this factorization that I showed you earlier and some other information, and you just get fix that and this is the amplitude that you get. And again, this works for arbitrary uh, order, arbitrary number of particles and arbitrary kind of pi to the power p interactions as well. I mean, I'm just sh showing you the easier uh, result. Okay, now probably it's like, uh, I'm already running out of time. So what is this me method good for? One is this factorization is emergent. So you have this, suppose you have like 12 gone. I'm just, just for fun, suppose you have 12 gone. 
and then you just take this x i j to be uh, zero. So this is just like physically saying you are taking some <clears throat> some propagator on shell. It should factorize, and this factorization I have like uh, described at least twice. The same thing as is like left amplitude and right amplitude, and you have this one over x i j. So this basically is saying that physical factorization of high to the power p amplitude is just geometric factorization of the accordiohedron, by which I mean. If you go to the boundary of accordiohedron, you will get only product of lower dimensional accordiohedron. So that's the property of the. Uh, maybe I'll just skip this. And this part it just says that there is another way of doing uh, uh, computing amplitudes, which is like computing volume of the dual polytopes. I've not described it. So good thing about this is that you can compute this volume of this object. Like there are many different ways, and they'll actually give you different kind of representation of the same amplitude. So that's very useful in physics, and that's like Feynman diagram is one one example of uh, such triangulation of the dual polytope, and it's also like it's a very sort of uh, yeah uh, maybe I can just skip this because the whole point is that we didn't use anything any structure in this other than this momentum space which is like quite boring, so maybe uh, in some some other context like quantum gravity where, where we don't have the notion of space time or anything it may play a role because we are just using some uh, some combinatorial objects and all this time and like there's nothing dynamical we are using so let's summarize by saying that the mathematical structure of uh, scattering amplitudes are like like if there are a lot of things to explore in these combinatorial uh, geometries and it looks like there is something hidden because all these maths literature are actually matching this amplitude somehow like there is no expectation like why should it be uh, where it's coming out nicely and the future direction there are many things one is i talked about only monomial interactions like five over p or uh, what about polynomial interaction with different kind of thing alok probably will talk about this he's currently working on that and uh, then there are things like going beyond planar limit it's a bit difficult because everything that we studied uh, true for planar, these XIJ variables are nicer. Also, including non scalar particles, that means that you add spins, and we don't know how to do that in current setting. So, it's like adding more data other than momentum, and then including higher loops. So, up to one loop, people have studied in these cases, but higher loops we don't know how to do because in one loop there are some cluster stru uh, structure, cluster algebra structure that I'll probably will also mention, but higher loop we don't know. Anyway, so we, I begin. I started the talk by saying that, that why physicists are interested in this uh, kind of uh, polytopes or combinatorial objects, and I hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful that many mathematicians will also be interested in studying uh, scattering amplitudes and explore these things to help us. Thank you. Questions and or comments. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have two questions. So first one is just related to the initial part of the talk where you showed the Feynman diagram. So now we have the talk. So like we can see that to the initial part, okay. you can go back. Uh, right at the start. Yeah. 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 yeah here. So here you have these two trees. So you have one, two, and one, four. So I was thinking if there's a one, three, and two, four here also, isn't that a possibility? Yeah, that's what we're doing here, right? This is just like- But uh, is there an edge? Like why isn't it- in We're that? exchanging this, right? Yep. So this is not connected. This two, four is not connected. Ah, okay. I mean, so I said like two, I mean, you cannot draw it on a plane. I mean, okay. these are the three. I mean, you, you cannot generate more than this. Like. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, plain, plain, planar things, and this is the the one. So that instance is not uh, not planar. Yeah, this is okay. this, this can never be like mm -hmm. drawn in a plane. You have to like sort of. And uh, so, yeah. in the latter part of the talk, you showed like uh, so the the dissections that you are considering are in some sense like like splits essentially. Uh, sorry, can you explain what that is? Uh, that is a subdivision with exactly two maximal sets. 
you, you, you mean this? Uh... Yeah, here. Maybe you can just stop here, maybe yeah. uh, to the previous slide. Yeah. So each of the channels that you mentioned yeah. uh, are splits. Essentially, they, they dissect into two maximal phases, your polygon, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not familiar with it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so there is a notion of compatibility for splits as well. So if I'm getting you correctly, what you are interested in is like start with the n polygon and then subdivide it in quadrangles, in your case, in phi four. So essentially, like this can be computed for like totally mathematically starting with splits, like starting with one edge and then adding an edge which is compatible such that it doesn't intersect. Doesn't, sorry. Doesn't intersect. Like I can take in this polygon another split that actually uh, like intersects it, and that that is something that you don't want. Yeah, but I mean, here it will always it always intersect, right? Because we are not. These are like different vertices of the same polytope. Yeah. It's not like we are not allowing at the same time. We are not allowing this and. Yeah, the other one. Yeah. Yeah, but but. Yeah. Yeah. Then might have. Yeah, of course. Ah, okay. Then you have something like this. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. what I was explaining there. So you have phi four and phi cube. Mm. Then one will try, one will be triangle, one will be quadrilateral. Then that is yeah. that's like dealing with phi power four and phi power three theory, phi cube and phi four theory together. Okay, that's so, also been studied. I mean, this so are you interested in like for like n is equal to twenty or something? Like getting these all of such yeah, possible. I, I think this generalized this accordia thing is generic for any p. Okay, so this mm -hmm. this compatible. So this this rule which was. Bit complex. I define it because it it generalized to any any uh, p mm -hmm. easy to generalize. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, for for strokes there are other ways to do it, but yeah, it's the most generic thing. Yeah. I just have a general question. So, uh, if you take a regular polygon like you have taken pentagon and or sometimes square and. Yeah and have triangulated them. So uh, there is a known fact that it, there are a number of triangulations of a regular n-gon is given by the Catalan number. number. Yeah. So I believe that uh, there is a sequence of traversing these triangulations cyclically one after another going around such that every time you go one from one to the next, you delete one diagonal and add another. Diagonal. Yeah, that's what we are doing. That's, that's called mutation. Yeah. That's exactly uh, the thing. So, the yeah. okay. So, uh, that sequence, uh, therefore, there will be a, uh, you can arrange the triangulations of a regular n gun yeah. in, a, a, in a polygon uh, of polytope. size, in a polytope of, with number of edges being the Catalan number. Yeah, that's exactly the Stasse polytope. That's, that's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. okay. Number of vertices will be the Catalan number, and each vertex will corresponds to a triangulation of an n gon. Yeah, n gon. Yeah, that's what I exactly I explained for this uh, phi cube theory thing. Uh, so Even for uh, for the phi four theory, there is this that's counting also known. This goes by the Fuss Catalan number. This is another uh, another number. Okay, so just like generalizing those things. So this grows factorially, right? So they are known. Yeah. Are known. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, where is the physics input in all thing, all these things? Uh, so, so you should uh, have put in some physics input before uh, you actually get the amplitudes, right? So, yeah. So, or there is none. If you if you just put, one thing is that we are dealing with this physics input is that probably you are dealing with this uh, I don't know trivalent graph and then think about this. I can motivate it, but the whole point is not to put any physics input and get out. Amplitude. If I put physics input, then it will be like sort of following Lagrangian kind of thing, right? Those are emergent. That's what I said. So this, this, I think I have still shared my screen. So this, or even some constants, uh, maybe. Are yeah. They so, there so anyway? If you if you talk about unitarity, this is just exactly this thing, right? This, uh, yeah. This is this is just unitarity. This just says that on pole, when I x i goes to zero, that's like hitting a pole. My amplitude, the residue of that pole is this ML times MR. So this left right product is just the standard factorization. So this is three level unitarity. And there is this XIJ pole, there is no other powers. That means that this is local. This is locality. Okay. So these are like output of the whole program, not input. That's okay. the sort of okay. strength of the program, I would say. Not yeah. And the 
are you i mean uh, so you are not considering the coupling constants in the situation or oh yeah I, uh, all that yeah, you are yeah. taking one here okay well, the, oh in, yeah yeah this is structure of these things so, okay yeah well, this logarithmic form that I'm considering is just because that's that's one physical input probably this log form that used that just says that we know the theory where tree level theory uh, you only have poles that's why you have this dx by x kind of thing suppose you have in one loop we cannot have that so people do it integrand instead of the full amplitude so that's one physical input you can say that's like uh, the knowledge of s matrices that uh, yeah the structure of this matrix that's one I had one more question. So, so um, is this method uh, valid only for phi uh, p type theories, or uh, is it uh, generalizable to other? I mean, multiple multi-particle theories like uh, gauge theories, for example. Yeah, it's not been done. But then you have to put correct uh, like this epsilon uh, tensors, or you have to know the numerator. So we okay. don't know how to deal with this numerator. We always deal with this dx by s kind of uh, mm -hmm. form. So this is a log form. So I think we need to go beyond that. Do you deal with higher dimensional polytops? Uh, yeah, but there are more this, particles. Yeah, but these are still the same form, same differential forms. Okay. Similar differential forms. We are not. Okay. Thank you. So, since we are a bit short on time, we'll take a couple of quick questions and then. Uh... So, again, related to his question, now the previous question. Um, so, uh, uh, so you're not interested in solving actual instances of uh, scattering amplitude experiments, maybe if that's the word. So, uh, so you're, 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 um, uh, so you have this instance of particles, um, uh, sca uh, bumping into something and then some, some, uh, some other uh, object, and then you, the scatter, and then you're interested in those momenta. And so you're, you're using this as a replacement for the, you know, for the Lagrangian, right? Yeah. And 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 so, given specific instances, you how, how do you use this to 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 obtain those momenta of the scattering particles? Yeah. So the the whole thing is that all we observe is amplitude, or rather, to be more specific, a scattering cross section. Ah, a local thing. Ah. Yeah. Suppose, but if you have this, uh, sure. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hello. Can you please? Make your comment, please. Yeah. Unmute. Oh. You can't unmute. Uh, Some right now, you, you should be able to. Hi, yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Hi, this is just related to the, I think, the previous question that if you have more than one species, like type of scalar particles, like one scalar particle with no mass, as Pinaki was explaining, and say five different scalar particles with different masses, then those S matrices can be explained using using this program also. So although we can't do like, you know, QCD or more general gauge theory, but with, we can have many different scalars with different masses and their S matrices also come from uh, positive geometry. Uh, and there also this, this thing is important, right? You have this Euclidean space and the other right. kinematic space. That that part will be important. Probably will explain in your talk, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think what was asked now also that towards realistic theories, we are kind of slowly, slowly trying to understand more complicated yeah. theories. Uh, and they all come from the specific cluster algebra realizations of the polytos. So no no physics input is put in and we seem to exactly. be getting... Uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, that, so just just one more comment i mean the as, as it was asked i mean the sort of the uh, th there is no physics input because the question we want to ask is we are given this kind of kinematic space as pinaki was explaining which is very barren so that's the only physics input we have the space of momenta etc and now in general we can write many many different functions with uh, you know meromorphic functions and one of the open questions in physics what which of these classify as s matrices of some quantum field theories and now what we are seeing is that at least if these S matrix come from positive geometries, then they are certainly, at least if these functions come from forms of positive geometries, then they are they are always S matrices of some quantum field yeah. theory. So it, it was really to classify S matrices that this program is sort of, uh, yeah, that's the question it's it's addressing. So uh, yeah, that, that I hope that answered one of the, the questions. We, we don't want to put physics input and see what, what we get just yeah, from that. The, yeah, that's the strength of the program, right? So yeah, just want to. 
Yeah, uh, thanks, Adok. Uh, so I think since there's, uh, we have time for a only very short coffee break, so uh, maybe we can end here and we can ask other later. questions uh, over lunch and other, you know, informal discussion sessions. Okay. So let's thank Pinaki again for a great talk. <laughs>